Welcome world to the season two opening of Nobody's a Nobody podcast with me, Mike McVeigh. This is the podcast where I interview people I find absolutely fascinating, and I believe you will too if you give them a chance. We start the season two opening with the book publisher, Lisa to Spain, and Jarvix is back with his hot dog song of the week called Drab by Neon Cathedral. Now, I don't know about you, I don't know how the last four months have been for you, but for me, it has been crazy. That's right, the past four months has supposed to have been rest and relaxation as I took a little break from the podcast, and what ended up happening is my life got flooded with life. So many different things have happened. In fact, even today, uh, the podcast got delayed coming out because we had to take my dog to the hospital. And right now, as I'm speaking, she is currently going through surgery because for some reason, a long time ago, (laughs) the original owners did not spay her. And this has caused problems and she's infected and it's just a big old mess. And she's six or seven years old. She's a big dog and had somebody done something right several years ago and not lied about it to the shelter when they donated her to the shelter Um, we wouldn't be going through this problem. So it's very stressful. And by the time I probably am finished, by the time you hear this, we'll already know what the thing is, but it's just stressful. And that's how life is. No matter what we do, no matter how much we try to get ahead, it continues to beat us up. (sighs) But that being said, (laughs) it was tough. It's been a tough four months. One of the things that is really, it made me really question, do I want to continue to do the podcast or not? And I had a few of you that said, oh, you're looking forward to the next episode. And I appreciate that. Really, I do. It it's, brings me both tears of joy and sadness because I'm just thinking of how much work it can be to do the podcast. And so you're going to notice a few changes. Um, we're going to have a little bit longer format, and I think that's a good thing. We're going to do a podcast every other week now instead of every week. Uh, but we are going to have some snippets. So some of you that can't sit through a full um, hour and a half plus show that you can listen to some of the better parts throughout the week. Um, and they'll be in the podcast player. They'll re- usually run between two and five minutes. So that's going to be kind of cool. And I want to really thank Matt Jensen for being so helpful for that idea and to help me with that. And this will also give me a little bit more time as work and the rest of my life. It keeps me busy. It will allow me to continue to interview fascinating people, but put out a decent product at the end. Now, There's so much to cover in the past four months, and I would love to tell you all about my life and everything else, Uh, but ultimately, this is not what this show's about. Maybe another time, another place, we will talk about some of those things, but this week, we have Lisa DeSpain, and I met her through, (laughs) I know it's going to surprise some of you, Toastmasters, and Lisa is amazing. Uh, She writes standard operating procedures for different companies and that's policies and procedures basically how do we do what we do and then while talking to her I found out she got into books and does book publishing and helps authors literally start from ground one all the way to publishing and it's called she has a website called book to bestseller.com and it's b-o-o-k the number two and then bestseller.com and she's an amazing person in fact I don't want to ruin it for you let's talk to her so here is Lisa Despain all right, so Lisa, one of the things I find absolutely fascinating about you, and I think this is going to sound a little crazy at first to most people, but at least for a while, you edited standing operating procedure manuals for companies, correct? Yes, that is correct. I did standard operating procedures for a yoga studio who was wanting to franchise her business and hopefully franchise her business to the mainland. She was located in Hawaii. Then I did standard operating procedures for an online coach, and she was wanting to use those procedures to delegate her her processes to other people, and then also scale her business. So those are the two things I've done so far. Oh, no, one more. I forgot about this last one. She does online business as well, and she did websites and Facebook ads, Google ads, all sorts of different very technical things. So we did a lot of standard operating procedures for her business. So it kind of ran the gamut from from setting up equipment to how to actually set up the ads and, and run the, the marketing. Now, I know this is a business that everybody's jumping in like, man, I want to make standard <laughs> operating procedures. So can you talk, 
I won't lie. A few years ago, I had no idea what it was. I'm not from the military. I didn't come from a group. And someone said SOP, and I'm like, uh, what's mm-hmm. that? So can you kind of explain what standing operating procedures are and how you got interested into making that part of your career? Standard operating procedures basically tell you how to run a process. They they can be written very linear in a very linear manner so very step by step by step but it it actually helps to start from a a high level and say okay what is our goal here what is the the goal of this procedure if we do it well what what do we hope to have at the end of the process then we we go into who is it for you know who are the people that are actually performing the process then we go into uh ex an explanation of a high level categorization of the things. So if you have if you have five very high level things to do, then you go sub subset and sub step and okay, now these are the things that are part of this big thing. So that's kind of the way it works. And a lot of times when I come in, somebody will say, okay, here's what we do. And they just kind of go blah. And, and it's a really difficult process to go okay so what does that mean like what how do we take this huge thing and then we go very small into the tiny steps in it and and usually what i what i was doing was i would get with them for maybe an hour once a week and we would talk about something specific so what what is your process for doing facebook ads for instance and they would say okay well we do this and we get this information from the client so then it it turned into something that was okay, the client portion of it, now it's the campaign portion of it, what is the goal of the campaign, now it's the ad set component, now it's the art. So, you know, what are all the parts of the thing that come together to make a process actually work? Now, that sounds really cool and complicated. And for you, I know this is just basic binary code and stuff, (laughs) whatever that is. Can you explain it to maybe... Can you give an example, maybe an everyday standard operating procedure or a policy manual or something that somebody that's not using Facebook ads, since I don't think most of us use Facebook ads, can you give us an example? Right. So if you're not using Facebook ads on a daily basis, good for you. <laughs> good for you. <laughs> so if you, could, if you think about your life and you think about the things that you do all the time, and I'll, I'll go into a different example. And this is something that I do very frequently as well. So I help authors get their books ready for sale. At one point, I was like, you know, all of this stuff is in my head. And it would be really, really cool if I had an idea of step by step by step all the things that need to happen. And I wrote it all down. It was 27 distinct steps that needed to happen to get a book to press, whether that's, we start with the manuscript, we run it all the way through editing times four, we set it up for print, we set up the cover, we do all this stuff. And it was, it kind of blew my mind a little bit because it was so many steps and it was all in my head. So if you're thinking about a standard operating procedure, you're taking all of those 27 steps and you're chunking it up into different parts and then you're writing it down so that if you needed to, you could take this document that you create, you maintain, and you keep, and you could give it to somebody else to say exactly how to do the same thing that you're doing. So now you become a you become a person that can be duplicated within an organization. That's really the point of it. I'm not sure how many people want to duplicate me, but I'm already on <laughs> board for this. We have lots of Mike McVeigh's running around, and the world will either be scarier or a lot more interesting. And I'm going to press you a little bit more, Lisa. I apologize. Most of us don't write books yet. I mean, maybe after this, everybody's going to write a book and they're going to contact you and you're going to make millions of dollars. And I'll be like, yay. But can you break it down to even maybe a more simpler thing that people would have maybe on like someone that might not necessarily even own their own business or anything? They're just a regular everyday. Can you give an example of a standard operating procedure? Okay. Let's say you're going to make a sandwich. Now you have to think, okay, what is the goal of this process? Well, I would like a sandwich that I want to eat that I'm going to enjoy and it's going to be tasty. Okay, so now what are the components? How do you know that you've created this sandwich that is gonna be what you want? The components would be, okay, the bread. What kind of bread are you gonna use? Are you going to take the bread out of the refrigerator or is it sitting on the counter? Okay, now what about the meat? What kind of meat is it? Is that in the fridge or where is it? 
What about the cheese? Okay, so now once you get all of your components, now you assemble. And if you think about it, that is exactly what they're doing at places like McDonald's where they have a very standardized product. And wherever you go, you're going to go to a McDonald's and you're going to get the same hamburger. It's going to be the, the bread, the patty, the cheese, the, the stuff on top, all of those things will be exactly the same. So that's what a standard operating procedure does is it standardizes, obviously, all of the steps that create the product whether that's a process or an actual product. Yeah, and I think that's a lot easier to understand, especially with the, with the movie that came out a couple of years ago with Michael Keaton talking about McDonald's and stuff and how they did that. So that, make, that makes a lot more sense to me, especially on my dumber days. And I appreciate that explanation. I guess when I think of operating procedures and stuff, one of the things I always think about is VCR, programming your VCR. And for those of you that are younger, VCR was what we had before DVD players. For those that don't know what a DVD player is, that's what we had before we started streaming everything. And if you don't know what streaming is, then wow, we are way <laughs> in the future right now. But the VCR manuals were just horrible and everybody had a really difficult time programming it. It didn't even matter, it didn't matter how old or young you were. It just seemed to always be a very difficult thing. And then as soon as there was a power fluctuation, you had to reset it again. And then finally, everybody's just used to that blinking 12 o'clock <laughs> permanently on their VCR and stuff. And right. would that be probably an example of a bad operating manual? Yeah, it's a little bit different because it's more of uh, features. You know, it's going to explain features and processes within the features. But uh, a standard operating procedure is more the steps you have to take to get a specific thing done. So uh, if you think about a, an operating manual for a TV or microwave or whatever, it's a set of different processes. It could be 20 different things you can do with this product. So then each one of the 20 things is what, I, what could be considered a standard oper operating procedure for each of those individual functions. Now, I won't lie, I did a little preparation for this interview to talk about standing operating procedure. And even though we only talked over the past few weeks about possibly doing this, I actually read a book approximately 15 years ago to prepare for this interview. I just didn't realize it was in preparation for this interview. Uh, Robert Piercig wrote a book called The Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. And he wrote this in the late 60s and published it in the early 70s. And one of the things he says in this book is that people who write the manuals and write some of the procedures and stuff are generally the ones who are worst or who, who do the worst at making the item. So like if you're having to construct, so if you're doing an Ikea kind of thing, basically the one who writes the manual is the one that is the least competent in the field. And that's why the instructions never seem to make sense with when, we, when we're putting this stuff together. Would that be accurate in your opinion? <laughs> that's a funny way to look at it, but I guess it makes sense. I mean, you'd want the, the person who is the most likely to have trouble to be able to to lay out all the steps. The part that gets me sometimes with, with something like that is it's hardly ever written anymore. So you might get, if you open a Lego box, you might get an explanation of what it is, but it's all in pictures, which is great if you don't speak the language, but then sometimes you just really want it to be spelled out. So to me, a really good standard operating procedure would have not only the the words, it's going to have, you know, exactly step by step, maybe bullet points of what really needs to happen. But then it could also have a visual representation, whether that's a picture or a video, literally walking you through the steps. So it's, it's kind of takes not the not only the the left brain, but also the right brain creative. Um, and then once those things are combined, that is a lot more complete, and okay. a lot more understandable. That makes sense. So that's really where I guess YouTube has really offered a lot of standard operating procedures and we didn't know that that's what it was doing. So we're learning how to play an instrument or learning a new skill. And I know there's tons of companies now like Skillshare and LinkedIn learning and all that stuff that do those step-by-step -step things. So that's really, a, that's a form of a standard operating procedure. Is that correct? Sure. And in fact, a lot of the standard operating procedures that I write, I will little, literally go out and look for the thing that I'm trying to write about, you know, I'm going to go to YouTube and I'm going to do my own research and then I'm going to watch the video. I'm going to link the video on the document and then I'll, I'll lay, lay out the steps so that it's just really easy and transferable for somebody. That's really cool. I never even, I mean, 
it makes sense again look when you say it, i'm like oh yeah okay um mm. sweet i've read a lot of stuff or watched a lot of standard operating procedures <laughs> right <laughs> Actually, how did you get into writing standard operating procedures? Was it just like, you're like, man, I have nothing to do today. I'm going to write a standard (laughs) operating procedure for how to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. (laughs) No, it was a, it was a business coach that I worked with and she was working on a set of standard, standard operating procedures for the person who was opening the studios. They had to have so many things documented, you know, whether it was uh, hiring employees or, or their software system, you know, like how to do the steps that they needed to do. They just had multiples. I I don't know, know, maybe a couple hundred actual documents that needed to be built. And my coach, my business coach just got tired because it was a lot, you know, and she, she brought me in and hired me to do the last of it. I, I wrote a bunch of software ones and maybe some, maybe some business structure documents. And, and I just, you know, kind of finished what she started. And then when I was done with that, I did the layout of the physical book uh, of, you know, the like a folder that you hand to somebody and here's the documents that here are the documents you need to make the thing happen. So, you know, a standard operating procedure could be something that's just online. It's just a document. It's a, you know, it's a Google doc or it's a a Word doc or it's one of those, or it could be physically something you hold in your hands and it's designed and it's, it's built for that. It can be either of those or both of those and and both ways are are completely fine. Yeah. That's one thing I I get the pleasure of getting to train people in different areas. Um, as you know, through one of our organizations, Toastmasters, I've gotten to do some training sessions and you've done a lot of great training sessions. I know how to be a treasurer a lot more because of that. So I'm sure you had your (laughs) SOP for that, but I like the idea of a standard operating procedure. And maybe again, Mm -hmm. it's something I probably used all my life, just didn't realize I was using it, but I like the idea because I, I know when I'm training new employees or I'm training people in a different area that sometimes we take for granted all the things that we know what to do. Um, and we don't think about how mm-hmm. someone who's come to us for the very first time is seeing that or the reasons why we do it. And I know, especially my generation and younger, that understanding why we do it is almost as important mm-hmm. as what we're doing for them to be able to go forward. And I, I'm going to do a side note, so I apologize. But my grandfather, um, we gave him a like an Apple II in the late 80s, early 90s, um, our old computer at the time. <laughs> and he wanted me to show him how to work the computer. And I was like, well, you just turn this on, open this up. It was a DOS program, you know, click this, click this, click this, and you'll be in the program you're trying to do. And he said, no, 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 no. First of all, I want you to write it all down. And so I just basically said the same thing. He said, no, I want you, the only thing you can assume is I've sat down at the computer. I want you to tell me which button to push, which direction to push it, how long to wait before the computer starts up. And so I wrote like an 80 something step thing mm-hmm. on notebook paper, single spaced <laughs> to basically get to the one program that he wanted to use on the computer. And that sounds, it's a version of kind of what we're talking about, right? Mm-hmm. That, and it seems to be so helpful for people to know why. I know some of us, like me specifically, I kind of skipped down to the end just to see what the final thing is. But it's really amazing that you do this. I mean, that, that is really, really cool. Hey, everybody. I want to make sure we always support our friend Jarvix and Make Oklahoma Weirder. Jarvix has added some more staff. There's more articles about different things going on in the Oklahoma music scene. And more importantly, he finds ways to completely support the music scene, not just by giving recommendations, but also providing crowdfunding corners where you can help raise money for bands to release their albums. He has, has more things going on his website, makeoklahomaweirder.com, which is literally spelled how it sounds. And please support them. I'm a supporter. I'm a big fan, and you can too. I also want to take a quick minute to continue to support OneOKC.org. That is OneOKC.org. That's One, Our Neighborhood Empowered. We've been supporting them now for a while, and they're still doing great work. They're continuing to find ways to help fight illiteracy here in Oklahoma specifically. And you can check them out at their web, website, OneOKC.org. 
OKC Improv has been taking up a lot of my summer. I joined classes. I'm about to finish level one, and then I'll start level two in September, and there's open classes. And if you join, you can actually go watch their shows on Fridays and Saturday nights for completely free of charge. So you can get to support local <laughs> comedy in Oklahoma City for free. And it's OKCimprov.com to sign up. And there's shows every Friday and Saturday night at 7.30 and 9.30. And it's $12 for one show or $20 for both. Or like I said, if you sign up for a class, you get them both for free. And you can go as often as you want during the season of your studenthood. So please come out and support or join. This is a great thing to take up some time and get away from some of the stress. OKCimprov.com So in addition to writing standard operating procedures, what's kind of been your background career-wise? Like what, what are the, I know you mentioned some stuff with software everything well I'll just be Mm -hmm. quiet and let you ramble and stuff I've always kind of been a process person and this kind of ties into writing SOPs but when I was in publishing I started in publishing in 1998 and I worked for a Christian publishing company I started as their sales assistant and throughout that time we had we started off with about 300 associates and then as as the company changed and publishing changed enormously in that period of time, we whittled ourselves down to about six employees. So as you can imagine, going from 300 people down to six was pretty devastating. There was a, there were a lot of times where I just basically had to help pick up the pieces. You know, whenever you lose somebody, the work doesn't go away. It just gets redistributed. So there was a lot of that. As I learned different parts of the publishing house, I became a lot better equipped to really understand the processes of everything, you know, whether that was the the software system or how we were running our warehouse or the marketing, you know, all of those things just really became much more clear to me as I, as I worked there. And then when I left the publishing company, I went into ebook conversion and I, you know, I learned all the processes for how to, how to convert an ebook. And it was kind of one of those, you don't really, you don't really get trained in ebook conversion. You just kind of have to do the work and, you know, figure out the HTML, figure out the CSS. So it's like, just like building a tiny little website, basically. I took my skills that I learned at the publishing company and built my own author services company. Then I was doing the ebook conversion. Then I started doing book layout and design, then cover design, then uploading files to the outlets and, you know, really just helping authors with everything they needed once the book was ready to go into production. Then I started writing standard operating procedures from from that. And it was just kind of a, a little side project, a little passion project. It was just really to get to know different things and and understand processes that people were doing in their own businesses. It was more of an educational thing for me than than anything else. And I just happened to get paid for it. So that was nice too. Yeah, very cool. Did you always find that you were kind of a creative person when you were younger and growing up? Or is it just something that creativity came as you became more and more comfortable with the publishing industry and the various aspects of that? I would say I've always been a creative person. I, when I was a little kid, I taught myself how to crochet. My mom showed me a few of the stitches. And then I said, you know, how do I do this one thing? And she was like, well, just read it in the book. Oh, okay. You know, so that mentality will just, you know, just read about it has always kind of been there for me. Uh, I, I like to think of myself as kind of a grandma in training for like all my, all my life. I, I learned how to crochet. I learned how to knit. I always be, I was baking. I I'm a quilter, you know, all of these, these older woman things that, <laughs> that I've just been doing all of my, all of my life. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you've always been trying to be grandma in training. And, I, and of course, I, I, even after our earlier conversation, the first thing you're talking about is looking in a book to see how to do it. And so mm-hmm. it's kind of, it's kind of funny how this all comes back again, you know, a couple of years later, you know, as a kid and then as now as an adult and stuff. And so you, you've had a couple different businesses, it sounds like of where you've helped people, work on various aspects of publishing that were your own Mm -hmm. private businesses. Is that correct? Yes. I started with, like I said, the ebook conversion and I had a have still have a website called ebookconverting.com. It was 
something that I started in, let's see, I, I converted my first hundred books at the publishing company. And that was just kind of work and just, you know, in training sort of stuff that was in 2009, I believe, right about when iTunes was set up for ebook distribution. So iTunes kind of started the deal. Well, no, that's not right. Amazon started the deal. iTunes jumped on board and that's when my boss noticed that this really was something that needed to happen. So I did, I converted as much of the backlist which backlist means it's been out for longer than nine months in a publishing house. So I converted most of the backlist that was worth converting and then um, worked on the systems to get them out there with the different distribution houses and then also our software system. So nerdy, nerdy time for me. <laughs> and then from there, you know, just um, working with authors, they need a whole suite of services, including design and a lot of the nuts and bolts of publishing that are just not part of the writing process. They're just really kind of, some of them are really hard for authors to also do. Yeah. That's one thing that I'm finding more and more as I get older, that what we're told as a kids, you know, you can be whatever you want. You can be an author and stuff and you're thinking, oh, okay, I just need to be a good writer. So I'll get a degree in English <laughs> or I'll get a degree in creative writing. And then you find out that's maybe like five to 10% of the business of being an author. Mm -hmm. And basically the rest of it is either how to promote yourself or to how to hire people to promote you. <laughs> you know, it's, 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 and that's, that's really cool that you do all these other services. And I, I've gotten to do a very bad version of creating my own book at one time. And I can definitely respect all the things that you probably could do like that. That took me several weeks or months to try to figure out something that you probably just have a standard operating procedure for. <laughs> right. And, yeah. If you think about an SOP in terms of the book publishing industry, you would have an SOP for book layout and running through the process of using InDesign. That would be, that would be something that could, an SOP could be written for. If you, if you think about an SOP as a kind of a living training document, that's, that's kind of the way I think of it too. It's just something that's always going to need to be changed. You're going to have processes you take out because it's no longer efficient things that you, you would recommend people do that, you know, maybe they're not doing. It's just kind of like setting out the rules. I like that. practices. Living training document, LTD. Yeah. So you go from SOP to LTD and LTD has that limited feel. So you can feel yeah. like go into the mall or something. I don't know. <laughs> um, unless you, yeah. Uh, <laughs> now, because you, are you still in, are you still involved in the publishing industry at all right now? Or are you like, I'm, I'm, I'm done with that stuff. Just from the author services and publisher perspective. So I do have publishers who are clients and they come, come to me with, essentially any any ebook conversion they need or potentially book layout i do that and then a lot of my authors are repeat authors so they have worked with me for years now which is fantastic probably the most most difficult client i have is going to be a first time author who kind of has an idea of the way the process should work, but it's not correct. So, you know, there's, there's quite a bit of, okay, you know, this is how this happens. And, and so much of it is holding hands and kind of pulling them back from the ledge a lot of the time, because right. some things, ha you know, things happen that you're just not expecting within the process. And I never thought this would come up, but my wife and I just started watching Silicon Valley and it's about a computer startup and the guy that creates this product at least for the part we're in, we're, we're in the middle of season three, he's trying to be able to still be in control of the product, but he doesn't know what it's like to run a business. He just knows how to write code or whatever. Mm -hmm. And that, that seems to be really, you know, it seems to relate really well, resonate really well with kind of what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then if you work with a publishing company, you relinquish a lot more control than you do as a self-published author. That's one of the benefits of self-publishing is that you have complete creative control and you have control of the timing. If you go with a traditional publisher, typically they are going to adjust things in your book to make it more marketable. Now that can be a benefit or it can be a huge detriment if you are married to your work, you know, if it has to be the way you want it to be, then that can be um, very difficult to, to let go of control. Plus, 
publishers typically have an 18, let's see, 12 to 18 month lead time. It's really, really hard to get things done quickly within traditional publishing because they're running their marketing well ahead of time. They're selling into stores well ahead of time compared to self-publishing where it's basically you're, you're ready to go once your manuscript is, is ready to go. Once the ebook is converted and once the, the print book is laid out, then upload files and you're live within two days usually. Right. No, that makes sense. I, I, I try to read a lot of books every year and I look at the ones that are kind of, I think prescient is the right word where they come out in the same, they're come out in a very timely manner based on what is going on. So you might see a, like last year, we might've seen a pandemic book in May. And so you just have to imagine all the things that are going on for it to come out that quick. If you're saying it's supposed to be a year, year and a half lead time that they had, they just had, and it wasn't a self-published book. It was through a major company. So you have to really think that that, yeah, um, the things were they knew it was going to sell. <laughs> right, exactly. So as a publisher, you have to have somewhat of a flexibility to have drop in titles like that, that are very much on the nose, very timely. And then also as a book seller, you have to have the same sort of flexibility that you're not completely blowing through your marketing budget and you reserve something for the things that are super timely that you want to take advantage of. <laughs> now, do you do anything at all with audiobooks, or do you do specifically just with some form of print? Yes, in 2020, I took on different sort, a different source of projects than I had planned, and I was just kind of like, okay, whatever, you know, I'm I'm happy to do the work if the work comes to me, and you know, I'll learn whatever I need to learn. So I did take a foray into ACX, which is Amazon's audiobook platform. ACX distributes to iTunes and Audible as a, a, a matter of course, and then also other exclusive outlets if you sign their exclu exclusivity deal. So I made some mistakes in the ACX process. Nothing is things that you can't fix. So we fixed all the issues. It was very interesting to walk through the process because I had to, I had to find the talent. I had to arrange for the payment. I had to uh, get the, the files to the, the narrator. And then I had to double check the narration to make sure that he wasn't dropping words or maybe he delivered, did he deliver the thing in the correct manner? So it was a very much line by line, you know, looking at exactly what he was saying compared to the, the PDF. Then once, the, once that process is done, the narrator, the producer can can complete the, the project and enable it for sale basically once it's enabled for sale then it goes to audible itunes and anywhere else okay and i, I find this like I, I really find this interesting and honestly for most of you out there i know that several of you contacted me saying that you want to write a book or you want to do various things and, uh, and we will get to your business in a minute specifically like the name and everything but lisa is one person that I trust more than a lot on a lot of areas because every time I do something with Toastmasters that requires a lot of things, I always try to get her on my team because she gets things done. And honestly, that right there. <laughs> it's fact, huge, it, right? It's, it, yeah, it really is, uh, especially when it's a volunteer type stuff. Um, and I know if she does that with the volunteer things that I can't imagine you not doing anything different. But we have several friends in the Toastmaster world who – are always talking about writing book. In fact, I know there's somebody that just posted something today on Facebook. And I know this is a month ago now, but um, you know, they mentioned something about doing an audio recording of some of their, their speeches and putting that in a book form. So uh, definitely contact Lisa if you haven't already. And if you have, <laughs> then pay her the price. It's worth it. Um, <laughs> now I was going to ask you, cause you mentioned this about um, Amazon with uh, their various, like it used to be create space and now it's, Mm -hmm. um, I can't it's remember. KDP, KDP, Kindle Direct Publishing. Uh -huh. So I'm going to, I'm going to back up a few decades of when Amazon really kind of started about the same time Alibiris was out there and it was a, it was actually probably the major uh, book place and, and Amazon eventually took that over. But how much has Amazon affected the publishing industry? I mean, I know, I know we hear it from all the big people and stuff, but was that the reason why you guys had to go from 300 people to six people? Or what was some of the things that were going on? How did, how did, how in your specific experience did Amazon change the picture? Amazon was a disruptor 
big time. At the very beginning, people were talking about, oh, well, don't, don't send your books to Amazon. If you're a publisher, you better not send your books to Amazon because if I'm a bookstore, I'm not going to order my books from you. Well, you know, change happens. And if you, at that point, if you weren't willing to play with Amazon, then, you know, it, it you could get away with it early on, but they became such a force in the industry that you couldn't not play after a while. They did have a a process where Amazon would buy books as they needed them, which is great. You know, it's just like sending, shipping your books to any other, any other outlet. Then they changed it to consignment. And at that point they were big enough that they could do that. And people would just basically let it happen. So whatever Amazon sold was whatever they were going to pay the publisher. That process was fine. Um, I think, I think a lot of a lot of bookstores really kind of saw the writing on the wall and there's still quite a lot of bad blood with with the industry and Amazon in a lot of ways. But it does become a, a point of if you want to survive as a publisher, you really do have to work with Amazon. You can't just not do it. It is just a fact that it's going to be uh, it's going to be a, a major player. If we're talking about ebooks. Amazon let me, was. Let me stop you for a second because uh, I know ebooks are going to bring on a whole different world and audiobooks mm -hmm. as well, or now audiobooks, not audiobooks in the 90s and 80s. Um, because I do remember specifically um, when, when my wife and I were, before we were married, we were looking for books for college, and Amazon was not the place yet. It was getting there, but Alabiris was the place you bought books online. And what did Amazon do different? Or do you, if you even remember, you might not remember. But what did Amazon do differently that not play, people like Alabiris and some of the other um, online sellers at the time that it that it became what it is now? That's a great question because I can't really remember exactly what it was that made Amazon so attractive. Could have been well. Let me let me throw a few things out. It could have been the platform. It's very easy to search and find what you're looking for on Amazon. Before they sold literally everything under the sun, I think people were going to Amazon because it was just an easy shopping experience. The other thing is, of course, the discounting. It, it was really kind of unusual to see heavy discounting online until Amazon. You could kind of see it in the store, but only for things that were not selling well, you know, like the clearance racks or whatever. Publishing is a weird bird because as a publisher, you have to take returns. You can't just say, well, discount, you know, discount the product on your shelves and, you know, like any other industry, if you, if you're not selling clothes, then you discount at 70% until the things get off your, sh off your racks. And then after that, you sell to a, a wholesaler and then they sell it, but it's not that way with publishing for some reason, when magazine sales went into grocery stores, for instance, they would put the magazines in the, in the grocery store. And then whatever they didn't sell, they just sent back that bled over into publishing. So then when a book goes into a store, then it, it is basically free returns. No problem. We don't even, you know, it doesn't matter whether you've had it on your shelf for two years. It's just become something that the bookseller expects. They expect to see this. Okay. So that's something I didn't know. Mm -hmm. uh, I did, my wife and I, we, we thought for a long time about opening a comic book store a few years ago and we studied all the stuff specifically for comics. So a lot of that return stuff, it, that makes sense to me of, of finding which comic books, cause and they, and the comic book industry completely changed also in that same kind of way, a little bit different because they're not allowed to do the same amount of returns. You have to pre-order so much and there's no returns um, anymore because of, different things that went on but i didn't realize that the publishing industry expected for those things to mm -hmm. come back right something else happened in the probably mid 2000s called just in time inventory it used to be that a salesperson could go to a bookstore and say okay this is going to be huge title you're going to need 50 copies of this book and we want you to stack them you know super high and and 
we're going to put all this marketing behind it, all this promotion, all this fantastic stuff. So the bookstore would, would buy in 50 copies. They might sell 30, which is fantastic, and send 20 back. Then just-in-time inventory started where everything was computerized. Then you would say, okay, we're going we're gonna to order in five books. If you have five books, if, you're, if you think from a, a customer's perspective, you have five books on the shelf, that kind of seems like a lot. So you buy a book and then the next person buys a book. Now you have three, that's not that many. So then all of a sudden you as the customer don't know what a big book is. Like what is the, the best selling book in this category? You have no idea because they may just have one copy. So then when the bookstore sells one copy, their just in time inventory kicks in and orders another copy. Now you've got one, 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 one. So that's what I noticed kind of mid 2000s was that we weren't getting the buy-in that we used to have. We weren't getting the, what they called load in, loading in the title uh, at, because the bookstore didn't know if they were gonna sell it. Plus they were using just in time to just replenish the things they knew they needed. And it was just a really different sort of uh, thing that happened. And a lot of times technology is fantastic for keeping us on track with inventory and things, but it takes away the nuance of knowing what a really good book is going to be and a book that's really going to sell, which is kind of right. more of a relationship with the salesperson and the buyer at the store. Right. And as somebody who's spent accumulation of months in a Barnes and Noble or in a, a Walden books, or, you know, um, I can't even think of the other one that went out of business. B. That. Dalton? Uh, B. Dalton, but I was thinking about the one that was more recent uh, that went out. Oh, like Borders. In, borders, yeah. Uh, and I think about, you know, I'll actually buy The Giving Tree. I'll buy two or three copies a year to give them out to people and stuff and make them depressed. Um, <laughs> but because it's such an impactful book in my life, it's one that I don't mind buying. But that's a book that definitely has a lot of appeal over multiple generations, multiple time and stuff. Mm -hmm. But then a book that I see on the shelf that I'm like, that looks interesting, but it's bottom of the barrel. I never even think about the fact that it's probably getting reordered, even though that might be the only copy that ever sells at that store before it eventually gets sold back to the publisher. And that, right. that's, that's, that's just kind of mind boggling yeah. in its own right. Um, yeah. And I now I almost feel bad about those hundreds of books. I never, I finished up, you know, the bookstore without buying, but I didn't have money yeah. in college. The, so the book you're describing is, is considered best-selling backlist. And every publisher is going to have a certain number of books that they would consider uh, evergreen, always in stock, always books that you can count on, they're going to sell. Then there's the, the front list, which is the stuff that is the new, current, right now, just published. And a certain number of, of, of books are just going to fall off the radar. Uh, and then if you are an established publisher, hopefully you have enough backlist to just kind of keep the doors open. <laughs> You just know they're going to sell evergreen. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's maybe not to everybody else. I mean, I used to have a library of like 10,000 books. So it, to that, mm -hmm. <laughs> just that idea is really, really cool. And also kind of freaky. And I can definitely see how that definitely changed that game in the mid, mid aughts of going from, mm -hmm. we just order X amount of books. And now uh, the point of sale systems allow it for us to actually track which books and everything. Cause I mean, I remember working at Eckerd and, uh, office depot in the nineties and some of that point of sale stuff was just getting initiated. So we were still doing a lot of manual counts that would send into whoever our location vendors are to order more toothpaste, you know, 10 more rolls of crest toothpaste because we sold um, 11 that week or something. And, and so I, it's now kind of coming back to me of like how painful that was. And then also <laughs> uh, understanding what the, what the roles were in that time period and then how we're moving forward. Now it's like, we don't even think about it. And you started going on to eBooks, which was a whole, I mean, on multiple levels that just really changed everything. Um, and it's still, we're still feeling the impact of it now mm -hmm. with everything. So talk about how, when eBooks kind of came to the screen, um, to screen, the scene of how <laughs> right. that, how that played into it um, from your side as, as someone who worked in the publishing industry. When eBooks were really mm, popular. So, okay, let me start with Amazon. Amazon had the Kindle platform for a very long time before anybody else jumped on board. It was kind of clunky and 
most of the, most of the publishers I knew were running through an aggregator. So you would send their send your PDF files or whatever to an aggregator, then they would do whatever they did, and then they would upload to Amazon, and that was how you got your book out there. When I started our ebook initiative at the publishing company, it was right about when iTunes jumped on board to distribute ebooks. The royalties were really great for authors. If you if you go direct with iTunes, for instance, you have a 70% royalty off your retail, which is fantastic. If you go direct with Amazon, it's 70% less delivery fees. So that's also wonderful. So it really was a game changer in that it's not only it's not just print now, you also have to do ebooks in all of the formats. And you might even think about audio. So it's just, you know, like just another thing that you need to do. The uh, cool thing about ebooks is that there are, there are different sales for ebooks compared to print. So for instance, if you consider the number of books that you put out there for fiction, you might have a one-to-one -one ratio. So one print book for every ebook that you sell. That's about standard. For nonfiction, it's a lot more likely that you're going to sell a paperback. So now think about how what, what that means. That means that your paperback is something that you're going to consider a, a reference item. You might have the physical copy and you might stick it on your bookshelf for whenever you need it. With a fiction book, you're likely to read it one time and then you're done. So maybe you don't need the physical book. Maybe you like the smell of it, but you don't need to have a physical book in your hand to enjoy the book. So I, I thought, you know, as I was tracking things, I thought that was pretty interesting. The outlets that I recommend authors work with are Kindle, and they do about 60% of sales. Then iTunes, they do about 30%. And then Kobo, which is a fantastic international outlet, it doesn't sell a whole lot of books in my experience for my authors, but they are really easy to work with. You know, setting up your account, super easy. The, the interface is super easy. It's a 70% royalty rate. So it's kind of like if you're already doing all this work, you might as well do that too. And then the fourth one has been Barnes and Noble. And honestly, they are falling so far behind the others that I, I don't know that it's as great of an outlet as it used to be, but it used to help to make up the remaining 10%. Yeah, I made the mistake of going with the Nook instead of the Kindle when I came out. And mm -hmm. the Nook was fine. I mean, the, the tablet itself was great for the longest time. But then two things I found out really quickly is that not many people, pub not as many people published the Nook. Mm -hmm. And then the prices were more expensive with Barnes & Noble than they were with Kindle. Uh, for good or for bad. I mean, it might be only 50 cents, but when you're buying, again, I generally buy, I'm afraid to say this out loud, but over 50 books a year easily. And 50 cents does add up on, sure. and that's not, uh, and you mentioned that like the one-to-one -one ratio for fiction or nonfiction. Uh, for me, I, I kind of, if it's a really great nonfiction book, I'll have a hard copy, I'll have a digital copy, and then I'll also have the audio copy. And because there's certain things I can get from each one of them and I can reference yeah. to. So, um, so some authors are really happy with me on certain days. If it's the right one, I, uh, they'll get three books from me <laughs> instead of just one cell, <laughs> but you would have been in it. I mean, I know audiobooks have technically been around actually since mm -hmm. I'd say the seventies, um, even though it was a different kind at that time, I think the seventies, you had more of, um, Amway style cassette tapes that, people did. And then, um, I, I, and I wouldn't be surprised, I don't know this, but I wouldn't be surprised if Amway or something like Zig Ziglar, where they basically sold their speeches in a book. So it was a cassette book. And then eventually some authors, not very many, because cassette books weren't really popular in the eighties, though there were available. The nineties, when, when CDs became very popular, you would have that. But what, um, what was that like going for transitioning from audiobooks being something that was more of a luxury item where it cost $60 to buy maybe a $10, $15 book to now um, I'll pretty much go to an audiobook first unless there's a specific reason to buy a tangible copy. Right. I'm I'm with you on that. I I prefer audiobooks myself and and you mentioned the buying the ebook, the audiobook, and the print book. I recently did that with something and it's not something I usually do, but I just needed more information. So I think that's a, 
an interesting point that you made. You know, sometimes you just need more than one format. When everything went from CD, cassette, DVD, or CD, or CD I already said, but when digital, digital, it really does kind of open up the possibilities. Everything really that we do online is digital. If you consider what the process is for even doing a print book online, it is still digital. You're uploading PDFs, you're uploading all, all of your information is right there. And the way I like to think about it is that when somebody buys a book on Amazon, a guy runs to the back of the warehouse, could be a girl, it runs to the back of the warehouse, prints one book, puts it in a box, ships it to the person and pays the author the royalties. It's just a really fantastic process for cutting down on waste, making sure that you have all the inventory you need because you just print it if you need it. I mean, it's just a really great way to go. When I was in Portland, so talking about old school bookstores, right? <laughs> how much we love them, how wonderful they smell and all of that. When I was in Portland, Oregon, they had the first ever espresso machine I've ever seen. Of course, leave it to Portland to have an espresso machine. But what it is, is a portable print book maker. They have all the files. They can print the book on demand as you need it. As long as it's in the catalog, they can print the book right there for you and you can take it home. Wow. Isn't that fun? Oh my goodness. I, I love that. <laughs> and that's also creepy in a really, I mean, not creepy, like, I mean, it is creepy. It is creepy because literally a book on demand, not even like book to order on demand, but literally a book on demand. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That, I mean, it is... just kind of opens all the possibilities. You can have any book you want. As long as it's in the catalog, they can print it. I'm not going to bother you a whole lot more on everything books. <laughs> uh, there's two other areas I'd like to cover if possible. One is the self-publishing availability that, Amazon definitely changed that game as well. I mean, Amazon, mm -hmm. it's funny that that's where Amazon got its start. And really, even now, when I think of Amazon, I still think of it as books first, whether it's audiobooks or Kindle. I still think of that before I think of Prime or I think of the various other aspects, which is kind of funny because I've read comments on different things and people are like, um, I don't watch that many movies. I don't need Prime or I don't I don't get enough free shipping. I'm like, that's not what you do, Amazon. You do Amazon for books. Um, <laughs> that's what Amazon's about, books. Right, um, I'm, I'm, Yeah, I'm, I'm the minority here. Um, <laughs> but the self-publishing industry has been something that's technically been around as long as people have something that they wanted to say and they had the money to do it. Mm -hmm. I know in the early aughts, it was not uncommon to be spending a minimum of $10,000 of your own personal money to get a very badly written book. If you didn't go through the process of editors and stuff, I mean, just the publishing it's process itself and how many copies you had to buy. And now Amazon um, has made it where literally you can, though they won't necessarily have tutorials that are great because I, I went through it, but <laughs> they have a way that you can print your own book and you can print one copy mm -hmm. and that's fine. And then, you know, if you want to wait five years and you order another copy, that's fine as well. Um, talk about how that that's changed the industry a little bit from, again, from your perspective of being an insider. Yeah. So it used to be that you would, you would go to a vanity press to self-publish your book. And so already there's a connotation of, you know, vanity, you, there must be something wrong with you and your book must not be any good if no publisher picked it up. Well, publishers are gatekeepers. They make decisions all the time about the kind of material that they want to put their money behind. It costs a ton of money to publish a book through a publisher if you are the publisher. So they have to make wise investments. When we used to look at our catalog and we would cut things, we would call it out of print. We're not going to print any more of it. All of our, all of these files go back to the author, the out of print. That number was 300 copies per month. So anything that sold less than 300 copies was considered out of print and it goes back to the author and we're not going to carry it anymore. Those days have changed. We can put our files out there on all of these different outlets and we can, like you said, we can print one book, we can print 10, we can distribute to bookstores if we want, we can distribute to libraries through the print on demand channels. So it's very, uh, it's very, a very open system now where you don't have all of these companies really controlling the process anymore. It's, it's much more author driven, much more reader driven. 
than it used to be. There are so many people who are just like me and who help authors with the processes that, that they need to do to get the books done. So I, I would, I would say now's the time, you know, if you're considering publishing, it is a lot easier than it ever used to be. Yeah. And having again, been a person that's done it probably the hardest way possible. I was fortunate enough to have a friend that edited it for cheap, but again, and this is not a slam on him. You get what you pay for. So if I pay a hundred dollars, I'm probably not going to get as much process, but because I can go to Amazon directly and there's a couple other places now that do it as well, maybe not to the same scale of Amazon. And you've already mentioned that you use Amazon. Mm -hmm. Why would I want to work with you if I could just do it myself? And I, I say this kind of jokingly because I do know how amazing you are, but you know, you run the website specifically book to bestseller.com, which has got the letter or the number two instead of the word two. Why hire you when I can just go to Amazon directly and do it? And that is a question that I, I struggle with. All, I, I don't struggle with it so much because authors come to me and ask me for help. The process is something that there are tons of rules. Let's just talk about book layout and book setup. There are tons of rules that a, a good book designer follows that people just don't have in their arsenal. They're, the software that I use is InDesign and the learning curve on InDesign is pretty steep. It's taken years, you know, basically to, to get to the, the point where I can knock a book out and, you know, be super happy with how it looks. The difference between using Word to export a PDF and then upload it for print versus InDesign to lay a book out and export it to PDF and put it, to, put it out to print is the difference between looking like you're self-published and looking like you hired somebody and you took the process seriously. That is a huge, huge difference. Now, a lot of people will take their Word document, their manuscript, and they will upload the manuscript to Amazon and let Amazon do the conversion process. Well, that's great if you have just text, but if you have any sort of bells and whistles in that ebook, you're going to have some serious formatting problems. If you have any bullet points, any images, oh my goodness, it's going to look a mess. If you try to uh, if you try to export out to HTML from PDF and try to upload that document, it's going to be even worse. So it really does take a lot of time and energy to get the files to the point where they are something that authors are going to be proud to show others. And that's really the point is that you have put hours and hours and hours and sometimes years of your time into these files and you want them to be presented in the best way possible. And that's what a professional does. And if I could have one more second on this point. Yeah, please, please. I have worked with so many cover designers who can design beautiful covers, but they are not fit to print. In other words, the dimensions are all wrong. They don't have the right uh, trim sizes. The spine width is all off. And I spend so much of my time correcting the work that others have done just so the book can be printed. So there's a I can't stress enough the learning curve that it takes to, and you know, all the tricks that, that I've learned uh, through the years to get a book ready to go and ready for press. It is a serious process. Yeah. One of the, and I, I'm speaking again from someone who went into it, you know, I read, in fact, I would say a good, at the time, a 10th of all the books I was reading were how to publish your book <laughs> and, and specifically how to use like the various online things and, uh, even though I had a picture and some of you are very familiar with that picture of my acorn tree that is on various things that I put out there, that picture was not easily modifiable. And I never did try to develop the skill to make it look perfect on the cover. I mean, it works. It's, it, it doesn't look bad or anything, but um, there is, a. I mean, even for someone that's fairly computer proficient, if you're not trained in that specific type of software and you're not willing to take the time to really learn it, I can very much appreciate <laughs> what you just said about the cover art and that was just for one and then mm -hmm. of course I did pictures in my book as well so the ebook is all jacked up and I apologize for all you Kindle <laughs> readers out there um but I and I do know like so let's and I know it's going to vary depending on people's likes because if it's going to have color um depending on the type of cover it's going to be if it's a hardback um the various things like having a picture and stuff is going to be different um but is there a typical cost or a, if I, if, 
if I've got a book written, it might not be final draft, but what, what kind of things would I be expecting if I were to come to you um, or mm -hmm. someone else that wasn't nearly as good as you to do this kind of process? I've been in publishing for 23 years now, so it's been a long time. I currently charge about $150 for an ebook conversion. And that's kind of like the starting point. If it has a lot of images and heavy formatting, then it would, it's going to be more than that. And that's assuming about three hours worth of work, including editing at, or, you know, tech, uh, HTML editing and formatting changes. Now that's super simple stuff, right? That's like your, your fiction without a whole lot of bells and whistles. Then if I go into book layout and set it up for print, depending on, on the size of the book, like maybe it's 75,000 words, that's about 240 pages. I'll probably charge in the 600 range for that. That of course includes file uploads and making sure that everything's ready to go for print. Covers are typically about 300 and sometimes I farm those out and sometimes I do them myself, just kind of depending. Editorial can be, can be really inexpensive or it can cost quite a lot depending on what the manuscript needs. Um, a typical serious editing job is gonna be about four rounds of editing. So four times going all the way through the book and looking for different things each time. And you know that, that's just by the project. But it, it can it can get expensive, and you know I I wouldn't I wouldn't be surprised if if things are pricing in the thousands compared to pricing in the hundreds. That's pretty normal. But the ten thousand dollars for just the just the publishing itself, not counting editing and stuff, that that's that really is kind of in the past, right? I mean, because mm -hmm. we're not going to buy a thousand copies of our book ahead of time or anything anymore. I hope not unless you're really, really famous. <laughs> right, you certainly wouldn't need to. The way I like to work is that I like my authors to have a direct relationship with their outlets. So I recommend Ingram Spark and Kindle Direct Publishing for print. And then the four I mentioned earlier for eBooks. So KDP, Kobo, iTunes, and Barnes and Noble. Ingram Spark does bookstores and libraries, and then Amazon does sales to individuals. So if you have both of those, you're covering your bases. We can use the same ISBN for both outlets. Okay. And you only need one ISBN for a paperback. You would need a second ISBN if you want to also do a hardback. Right. Ingram Spark does hardback. You don't necessarily need an ISBN for your ebook because no outlet is currently requiring that. So that, you know, that's another way to save a little bit of money. And then let's see what else. Oh, so the direct relationship and you asked about the $10,000 price tag. Well, that to me, if something is going to be charged 10,000, I'm going to assume we're gonna do the four rounds of editing. All of the book packaging would be included, the cover, the interior design, all of that. It's probably going to be a larger book, like in the 300 page range compared about 100,000 words compared to much less. It might include some marketing and I would hope that you would get some physical copies in your hand for that price. So that that's what a 10,000 price tag would be in my mind. Okay. Now a couple subsets that aren't necessarily, I mean, we talked about, you know, the big, the print books, the eBooks and the audio books specifically, but you know, a lot of people are huge fans of uh, genres like comic books, like, and I don't mean comic books, but like Calvin and Hobbes or Family Circus kind of things. Do you do those kinds of books as well if they were to come your way? Or is that something that you're like, you know what? I know I have somebody I can have you talk to if you're going to do that. <laughs> I've dabbled a bit in books for children as far as, like I did some some curriculum couple of couple of things. I had something that was a math related curriculum for a school district. So there were some illustrations and a lot ton of pictures in that. And then I've done some comic book adjacent things where I had to hire out for an artist to to, you know, create for the, the specific thing I was looking for. So I've dabbled a little bit in it, but really it's not coming up that often. And it's not something that, that I have to do right there. There's one more thing on, on picture books, children's picture books. That's, that's something that is definitely doable through the print on demand space. Then also with eBooks, it is doable, but less fun. It is a fixed format 
so it looks exactly the same as your PDF would. Okay. And that is not as fun for me to build because it's very specific on how things need to happen. Fonts need to be embedded and it's just this whole thing. So I don't do those as much anymore as I used to. Um, but, you know, every once in a while those come up as well. Gotcha. Yeah, I have a friend who's working on some comic. He's starting to draw graphics and doing kind of like a comic, like a daily strip kind of thing. And he's looking possibly to publish. And he knows who I'm talking to because I know you listen to this podcast. <laughs> um, so Lisa can possibly help you direct you in the, the, those areas, Rob Trotter. Um, <laughs> and uh, and do you have like people for voice actors of who you're looking for? Or do you or is that something that you're still trying to develop? Or is that something that you're kind of like, I'll do it, but it's not really what I'm wanting to spend my time on? Yeah, it's not exactly my my main focus. It, it it pops up every now and then, and it's something that I can help with. ACX honestly is super easy to work with. ACX is another one of Amazon's companies. Amazon tended to buy companies that were already working in a space. So like CreateSpace, that was a self-publishing company that Amazon acquired and then brought it into the Kindle Direct Publishing platform. ACX is the same sort of situation. ACX was operating independently of Amazon and then Amazon brought them in. I've worked with talent over on ACX and it is honestly super easy. So what you need to do is look for the narrator that most closely resembles the way you want your book to sound. I found a fantastic narrator for a nonfiction book that I helped an author with. And he was his, he was a voice actor. So he really had the intonation and the pacing and it was all just fantastic. Being an audiobook listener, I understand when I hear good talent, you know, sometimes you hear talent, you're like, eh, you know, could have been better, but, but this right. guy was fantastic. And he just basically walked me through the process. So that was super helpful. Any publisher you, or any producer you work with on the ACX platform is going to be fairly well versed on how to get the technical side of things done Very cool. and not that expensive. Well, I was surprised, know. not that expensive. Yeah. I know one of the things and I, and Scott, I promise you will eventually record my book, uh, but, <laughs> but I know sometimes it's fun to hear the author speak the book because especially if it's more of a memoir biography type thing, but there's also something to be said that someone that just has that voice that you're, you fall in love with. I mean, not everybody is Matthew McConaughey where you can just listen to him speak and um, have heart palpitations at the same time. <laughs> all, and, right, all right, all right, all right. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. You know, <laughs> Uh, in fact, his most recent book, it, it's beautiful. I mean, I've heard mm -hmm. the print version is great, but the audio version is just perfect because it's him telling. But I also think of how my voice is and I'm like, yeah, if you know me, it comes out great. But if you don't know me, it's kind of <laughs> like, no, Scott's the guy you want to hear read this book. That's what I'm doing currently. I'm, I've been dabbling over the past roughly year or so about change and what it takes for people to embrace change get behind the idea of change. And I'm, I'm going to launch at some point a company that helps people with change, whether that's an or, uh, on an organizational level, the change that happens, the, the way that people can work through the process. I was able to get change management certified back in January. So I do have that little certification behind my name. Congratulations. But it's just, oh, thank you. Yes, it's just become kind of a... a a passion project just to kind of understand the way how people where people are coming from and how to help guide them to a place where they are happy to happy to see something different right you know because because change happens and it just kind of hits us in the middle is the prefrontal cortex and it registers as pain and it's the pain of having to think through uncertainty and difficulty and and make new connections and make things better and then once you get through that things are better, right? So I'm hoping there is a, an opening to, to help people with that. And my next step, I think, is to become project management certified. So the PMP is my, my next big trick. And that's, Good that's been a big that. deal. <laughs> yeah, <it's> been... <laughs> I've, I've looked at some of that through LinkedIn Learning and mm -hmm. I was just like, oh, this is probably going to be easy. I was like, oh, my goodness, uh, I am not disciplined enough right now to even consider starting this process. <laughs> <laughs> right. 
Right. And it, the, the reason I'm thinking about that is because, you know, yeah, it, you can talk somebody through the change management process, but unless you're able to actually help them with a plan, you know, it, that, that really is where the rubber meets the road. So I just want that extra thing where it, it makes sense. And so much of my, my previous experience has been with project management, you know, like, okay, something's changing, you know, our, our, our software system needs to change. And so what are the steps to lay that out? So you know exactly what's happening, your people are trained, you go live on the first day, and you know exactly what your processes are. So that, that to me feels like the next logical step for me. And, and I look forward to being around more people in the change management world going forward. That makes absolute sense based on the trajectory that you've taken over the past 23 years or so. Now, just out of curiosity, what was your degree in in college? Oh, my goodness. It was political science and international (laughs) studies with a minor in economics. Okay, so exactly the same thing as publishing. I I know, right? (laughs) Political science, you're just like, hey, give me Hobbes. (laughs) <laughs> and Hobbes gives you Leviathan and you're like, man, I should just go in the publishing industry. It's a great, yeah, it's a great you know, thing. <laughs> obviously. <laughs> well, that, that is very cool. Uh, I would definitely like to keep tabs on you on that. I know we, we interspersely talk throughout the year, but as you're working on that change management company, everything, I would definitely like to keep up with that and definitely promote you because uh, even though we aren't the best of friends and hang out at bars and clubs and everything together, <laughs> Uh, you're one of those people that I've always um, had just a really high respect for and watching how you do things. And I don't joke when I say whenever I have to put a team together, Toastmasters related specifically, uh, I'll, even reluctantly sometimes as it happened most recently, that I'm like, hey, <laughs> can you recommend somebody else? And you're like, hey, that was a sly way. It's like, no, no, no. I really was not trying to get you into it. I was trying to give you a break. But uh, because you're amazing, it makes it a lot easier to, to reach out to you. And I definitely am going to promote that book to bestseller, like book, the number two bestseller.com. And Lisa has an amazing website, kind of got an Indiana Jones, Carbon San Diego kind of theme going there. But no, I I really mean that you're maybe even outside of Toastmasters, I'll have to start um, hitting you up to try to work on projects uh, and change management. Yeah, sure. (laughs) But uh, very cool. I, I love your website. And and hopefully yeah. we can help generate some business for you or more business for you as you continue to develop to being that person that you're trying to be and don't know yet what you're becoming. So, <laughs> well, thank you very much, Lisa, for being willing to be on the podcast. Yeah, my pleasure. It's been fun. Hot dog. 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 Hey listeners, it's Jarvix again with my Hot Dog Song of the Week. This episode, I've got a new track from an alt-gaze band called Neon Cathedral. And yeah, alt-gaze is totally a genre I just made up, but I think it fits. Up front, I should probably confess my fandom for another band called Haniwa, a project that branches into Neon Cathedral. Haniwa is no longer together, but for several amazing years, they made atmospheric indie rock music that had so much careful thought and passion in it that I've always been a little upset that it didn't gain more traction. To the casual listener, it was thick and moody, certainly, and I'm sure I wasn't the only one struck by the scorching beauty of it all, but there was something more, something cryptic, like emotions veiled in emotions, a deeper meaning that laid mostly undiscovered. There's a great full-length album they put out in 2017 called Violent Sun, and I can't recommend it enough. Fast forward a few years, and two members from Haniwa have rejoined to become Neon Cathedral, a duo that carries the former band's torch of serious introspection and intangible themes in a new light. The duo has a debut EP releasing on August 6th called Velvet, and when you pre-order now through Bandcamp, you'll immediately get access to one of the songs early. It's called Drab, and it's the song I'm sharing with you today. Drab is dark and gothic in such a gorgeous way. The low end of the bass and guitars are just heavy and crunchy enough to provide the grit beneath the layers of silky reverb to counterbalance the synths and impeccable lead vocal harmonies. 
Just listen to the moment late into the track where the entire rhythm section drops out. It's intoxicating, angelic, and ungrounded. It brings out the fragility of its porcelain high end, like a teacup in midair to be caught, and the velvet glove of the full arrangement as the guitars come back into the mix. It's breathtaking, but if you pay attention to the lyrics, you'll hear that it's also breath-giving. From the forthcoming EP, Velvet, here is Drab by Neon Cathedral. Cathedral and thank you Jarvix for recommending them. Jarvix mentioned Bandcamp and Bandcamp Friday is this coming Friday uh, August 6th and any 100% of the proceeds you give for donations or for buying the music goes straight to the musicians. Bandcamp does not take a cut on the first Friday of every month which is this coming Friday. 
But thank you again, Jarvix, and thank you for allowing us to use your hot dog song for the hot dog song of the week. Thank you to Matt Jensen for creating the cover art for this season. And (laughs) please support your local improv, wherever city you live in. Oklahoma City Improv here in Oklahoma City. Uh, Support 1okc.org. And feel free to check out Lisa's booktobestseller.com, where she just does an amazing job to help you succeed as an author. It's going to be a fun couple weeks. I look forward to introducing you to our next guest soon enough. And I want you to remember, no matter how bad life gets, no matter what trials come your way, nobody is a nobody. And that means you. Until next time.